Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with a new better pen and perhaps some more, more, more orbital mechanics for you. Now, last week we started with this equation, or I never set in mind last week. Yesterday we started with this equation that said v squared is equal to mu times 2 over r minus 1 over a. And that was a really powerful equation, if you remember. It allowed you to calculate the velocity of things in orbit. Uh, mu was the gravitational constant times the uh, mass of the parent body, r was your current distance from the centre of the parent body, and a was the semi-major axis of the orbit, which is of course the average of the periapse and the apoapse. And from that, of course, you could figure out the velocity in a circular orbit, you could figure out the velocity of a particle in an eccentric orbit. And most importantly, by combining these, you could start a body in a circular orbit, right, with v velocity center uh, circular 1. Uh, you could go into an eccentric orbit, right, with a, a new velocity here, which would be v eccentric at periapse and v eccentric at apoapse, VEA, v uh, VEA and VEP, and then once there you could go into another circular orbit, right? Uh, which would be, have a velocity of VC2 for the second circular orbit. And of course, at each stage you would go from V circular 1 to V eccentric uh, periapse, and that would give you a delta V1, and here you would go from VEA to VC2, and you would have another delta V2. And of course, you could add these things together and figure out how much delta V it took to go from orbit 1 to orbit 2. Or from orbit 2 to orbit 1, because these things cut both ways. Problem that I never, one thing I never covered, or of course I was saving, was inclination. Now, inclination is where two objects are inclined in different orbits. Now, if you take these examples, right, at this, I start with a velocity v eccentric apoapse, right? And then we go into velocity circular 1. And of course, that meant that this delta v was the difference between these two lines, and that would be dv2. Now, when you have an eccentric, uh, when you have a, a maneuver onto an inclined orbit, these vectors aren't pointing the same direction. Instead, you might have v, uh, say, v e a is inclined, and then v circular 1 is down here, and there's an inclination change in the middle there. And so in this case, it's all it's the same. You basically the, connect these dots here, and that is your delta v. Now, of course, we are primarily concerned with the magnitude of the delta v. So uh, we don't actually care about the exact thing. We can figure that out. But we just want to figure out how long this is. And how you figure out how long this is, is you use the cosine rule. Now, the cosine rule says that if you have two adjacent sides of a triangle and the angle, then you can compute this third side by uh, using this re relation. So. The cosine rule will say dv2 squared is equal to uh, v1 squared uh, plus v2 squared minus 2 v1 v2 cosine i, right? And I'm saying this is v1 and this is v2 just because having too many subscripts makes it complicated. So uh, using this, you can plug in all the values you need and figure out exactly what your uh, delta v will be if you include an inclination change. Or, for example, maybe you're just performing an inclination change without any uh, change in velocity. So in that case, in the case that v1 is equal to v2, we'll just say is equal to v, then uh, delta v becomes a much simpler one. It becomes 2v squared times 1 minus cosine i. And uh, if i is equal to 0, then cosine of i is equal to 1. That means this is 0. And if you multiply the whole thing out, of course, that means that delta v is 0. 
If, on the other hand, say uh, cosine i, uh, say i is equal to 60, if i is equal to 60 degrees, then uh, cosine i is equal to 0.5. And that then says that uh, dv, oh this should be a squared, dv squared is equal to 4v. Uh, well, no, is equal to v squared, <laughs> which of course says ultimately that your delta v is equal to your velocity if you make a 60 degree plane change. And if you make a 180 degree plane change, it's two times your velocity. Your delta v for making an inclination change entirely is, is strongly dependent on your initial velocity. So if you are in an eccentric orbit and you want to make an inclination change, it's best to do it here because you're moving more slowly co compared to here where you will have to expend more fuel to make that inclination change. But, 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 if you're actually doing this and you're coming from one orbit and we're trying to get into geostationary orbit, now maybe because you've launched from a planet with a, a launch site that is not on the equator. Your initial orbit here may not be inclined, may be inclined, right? Uh, so this orbit will also be inclined, and perhaps when you get into this geostation orbit, you need to con correct your inclination when you get there. So uh, I'm going to take the example of the the SpaceX launch recently where the transfer orbit was a 22 and a half degree inclination. So if we take I is equal to 22.5 degrees, right? Then cosine I is equal to 0.9239, right? Roughly speaking. And uh, if you remember, I, per I calculated the energies or the velocity that delta V needed to go from this orbit into this orbit. And, uh, and we said the delta V normally was uh, 1466, right? When, when there's no plane change, right? When, when I equals zero... If I is equal to 22.5, we need to do this calculation. So the VEA, all right, the velocity when we're in our eccentric orbit at apoapse was 1607. It's actually 1607.4995, etc., etc. <laughs> and uh, V circular, right, V circular 2 was equal to 3074, right? So, of course, this is that minus that. But when we have I equals to 22.5, well, we plug it into this equation and we'll ask uh, dV with an inclination change squared is equal to um, V1 squared, so that's 1607 squared plus uh, 3074 squared minus 2 times 1607 times, I should probably make that, times 3074, I'll move it over, times, what is the cosine of I of 22.5? It's 0 0.9239. Three, nine. And those people who are plugging the numbers into their calculators will get something that says that delta V is equal to 1703.8 something meters per second. So if you are going in from a, a 22 degree transfer orbit and you're wanting to kill your um, inclination as you arrive, then it takes a couple of hundred meters per second to do it. Now, uh, you can split the two maneuvers, but this is far less efficient. You want to combine the two maneuvers. You don't want to do an inclination change maneuver and then the uh, actual insertion. The insert, similarly, you don't want to do the insertion and then the inclination change. You want to combine these things. Now, 
Uh, this leads me to one other part where uh, I was asked about the TICOM satellite that was launched by SpaceX. And actually, TICOM launch, right? TICOM 6. It, its transfer route was actually completely different. It was not what we did here. We never went straight to uh, geostation orbit. It actually went into a uh, 290 by... Um, 90,000 kilometer orbit, right? So it actually went into a much higher orbit, and then there's, of course, a 22.5 degrees, right, inclination. So people ask me, why do you do that? Why would you go way up above the geostationary orbit? Uh, well, what they do, of course, in this case, is this is a trick to reduce the amount of uh, delta V needed for the inclination changes, right? So let's actually do this calculation. We know uh, to get into, uh, okay, so we go into that orbit, right? Uh, we're gonna start here and we're gonna go up into this orbit, right? And then we're gonna come back down into geostationary orbit, right? So this is roughly our orbit. Our initial orbit is like this. It's uh, we're going to say 300, right? 300 down here, 90k here, and uh, this final orbit is, of course, about 40, uh, you know, 41k or whatever, right? So this is geostationary. So it turns out that uh, to go, if you do the inclination change here, you're actually moving a lot slower. So this velocity um, eccentric at apoapse is much, much lower. It's equal to 731.9, so 732 meters per second, right? So that's the velocity up here before you go into this transfer orbit. So that's when you make the inclination change, right? So uh, you make the inclination change to get into this orbit. Uh, the target velocity, Vc at uh, 90, is equal to uh, 1586. Eight six meters per second. It's like one five eight six point three meters per second. So uh, when you include the inclination change, and I just realized I got to do something. So yeah, we follow the same equation. We do dv one squared is equal to uh, seven thirty two squared plus one five eight six squared minus two times seven. 3, 2 times 1, 5, 8, 6 times 0.9239 and then we come out that delta V1 is equal to 952 meters per second. And uh, okay, that's fine, but now we have to get down from this orbit Right? This is us transferring into this elliptical orbit. Now, from this elliptical orbit, we have to go into a circular orbit here. Uh -huh. Right? So we have to come down and we'll hit and jump into this orbit here. But we don't need to do the inclination change anymore. So from this uh, 90,000 by geostationary orbit, um, the the final velocity that we, we come down faster, right? So we have uh, V1 here, the initial velocity, or V is equal to 3625.9, and uh, V2 is equal to 3074, right? So the delta V in this case is equal to 551.9. Uh, just got to remember to round these things. So you add these up and in total you actually get a slightly lower um, delta V. You add these up and the total for the, the insertion is e total delta V is equal to 1504.1. And we compare this against 1703. So we have saved 200 meters per second by going into this higher orbit initially. And uh, so, yeah, it takes a little more delta V to kick the spacecraft into this initial high orbit. But 
that is all Falcon, that's all SpaceX doing their thing. Once the satellite is released, the satellite is using its own fuel to actually insert itself into the geostationary orbit. And uh, so if you're a person that happens to own this satellite, you want to make it use as little fuel as possible. So if, say, SpaceX, the Falcon, has a couple of hundred meters per second of Delta V to spare, then uh, they would ask it to insert it into this higher, more eccentric orbit because they know that ultimately they're going to save a couple of hundred meters per second themselves on their final fuel product, yeah, fuel requirements, and therefore uh, leave themselves with more fuel for maneuvering while in orbit. And so uh, that answers the SpaceX question. I think I'm going to maybe continue this if this all made sense, but uh, <laughs> maybe not. Ask me questions. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.